is the Holy Spirit? I think many Christians have an understanding of God the Father and God His Son Jesus Christ, but we don't know the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, as we ought. You know, the Holy Spirit is symbolized in Scripture with water, with the image of a dove, with fire. How do we put all those things together? Who is the Holy Spirit? That's what we're going to find out tonight. I'm so excited to talk with you tonight about the Holy Spirit, and we have a great guest, a dear friend of mine, Dr. Mark Gieschek, who is a professor of scripture here at the Augustine Institute, and he has a, a, a couple books that are going to come out soon. One book that you have out is Light on the Dark Passages of the Old Testament, is that right? Yeah, with Light OSV? on the Dark Passages of Scripture. Yeah. yeah. So. Uh, Mark, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. It's great to be here. Yeah, and I'm really looking forward to talking with you about the Holy Spirit. You know, I think a lot of people have a better sense of God as Father, God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, but the Holy Spirit kind of gets neglected. There's a lot of confusion, or we don't even think about the Holy Spirit when we pray to God, I think, for a lot of Christians. Yeah, I think that's true. Sometimes he's sort of the, uh, the third wheel of the Trinity, right, yeah. where people kind of don't invoke him or mm -hmm. call upon him, but in fact, the church invites us to uh, throughout the liturgy, right, and throughout the life of prayer that we're really called to actually invoke the Holy Spirit and invite him to speak to us and to work in our hearts. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I, I think of is some of the symbols that are used for the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. just to kind of start there. And, uh, you know, you have the Holy Spirit with water, the baptism of Jesus, the waters of creation, the Holy Spirit you know, hovers over the waters in, in, in the beginning of Genesis. And then you also have the Holy Spirit with fire, you know, uh, you know, the tongues of fire at Pentecost. And yet you couldn't get two more, more contrasting images, water and fire. Don't quench the Spirit. But so that, the idea of the Holy Spirit is fire, and yet how could we talk about the Holy Spirit as water and, 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 and yet fire? Uh, let's, let's talk about those images. Yeah, so people. maybe one way to, to think about it is in terms of... Um, movement or process, right? So the, the word for spirit in Hebrew, ruach, yeah. um, and the word in Greek, pneuma, they basically mean breath, right? Ble breath or spirit. And so we know that a person has died right, when they stop breathing. Mm. Um, and so there's a way in which there's a connection between breath and spirit, right? When, when someone is breathing, we know that they're alive and that there's a kind of um, inner dynamism to, to who they are, right? That they're, that they're uh, moving and breathing and changing. And there's something about water and about fire that's very similar, right? They're both kind of fluid and changing and moving and seemingly alive, particularly living water, right? Mm. Which we hear about in John chapter 4 in the right. scene where Jesus speaks with the woman at the well, right? And he says, you know, if you had known who I was, you would have asked me and I would have given you the living water and it would become like a spring welling up within you. And what he's describing is that spiritual process, right, of becoming alive with the gift of faith, alive mm. with sanctifying grace, alive with the Holy Spirit. So it almost becomes like a, a flow of water, right, or a spiritual life coming out from you. Uh, and of course, that's symbolized, right, in, in when Jesus is wounded on the cross, right, and water and blood pour forth from his side, right, symbolizing baptism and the Eucharist, right, in the life of the Holy Spirit. So I think fire and water, even though uh, they're contrary to one another, right, and that water extinguishes fire, in mm -hmm. some ways they're actually complementary, right, mm -hmm. in that they have this kind of living, moving component to them. So much so, in fact, that in some of the mythology of the ancient Near East, they would depict um, uh, the end of life as a kind of river of fire, mm -hmm. where you would, you would pass through this river of fire and, uh, to, to go from life to, uh, you know, through the, the, the passage of death, and, uh, and that this river of fire would purify you or sanctify you, change you, um, and, and perhaps destroy you. And I think that the Holy Spirit has that same uh, component, right? Jesus says that the Holy Spirit comes uh, to convict concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And oftentimes we don't think of the Holy Spirit as bringing conviction and judgment. We think of him as bringing life and newness, but the, the presence of God has this power to it that if if we're properly disposed, right, in a state of grace, it purifies us and changes us. But if we're, uh, if we're not properly disposed, it can actually be harmful to us. 
Do you think that, that image of fire, I, I want to examine that in, for, in yeah. a minute, but I also want to invite everybody to, to take your questions. Text us your questions. We have a text line for that. Just give us your name and your question and text us at 720-650-0100. Uh, we would love to have your questions. Any questions you have about the Holy Spirit uh, in Scripture, who the Holy Spirit is, how the Holy Spirit works in our lives, we would love for you to join our conversation. We want to hear at the Augustine Institute. Take your questions and, and give a, a good theological, faithful interpretation. So, Mark, let's, let's explore this idea of fire because you, you use the imagery of purifying. Yeah. And, of course, the water imagery tends to be birth and life, like mm -hmm. you said, the living water. And yet the fire imagery for the Holy Spirit tends to be more towards purification. Yeah. And uh, I think of the burning bush sure. uh, as an image of fire with God or you know, Elijah's sacrifice with fire. That seems to be something that has to do with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think also like Psalm 51, right? Take not your Holy Spirit from me, mm. right? Where there's a, a consciousness in the Old Testament in particular, in like the ritual purity law and this sort of thing where fire is a way of achieving ritual purity, of, of moving from impure to pure. Mm. And I think when we see the Holy Spirit come upon individuals like prophets and judges and kings and the apostles and the Virgin Mary in sacred scripture, what we're witnessing is that kind of purifying power, right? But also the, the power of speaking words on God's behalf. Um, so the Holy Spirit in that way is this, I, I mean, we have to be careful, right? That we don't fall into heretical notions, right? I was almost gonna say he was a vehicle, right? But it's like, mm -hmm. he is the presence of God uh, mm -hmm. in us and, that changes things. And I think fire is a, is a great way of symbolizing that. I want to explore that a little bit because you, you, you talked about the example of David and the Holy Spirit coming down and anointing upon David. Yeah. So the Holy Spirit indwells, and that's one of the terms used throughout the New Testament. Right. Uh, Jesus uses this idea that the Spirit will come and dwell in you. Exactly. Right? So the Holy Spirit indwells, and it's a, the Holy Spirit's a person, right. and it's, a, it's the Spirit of God. We have our own spirit. And so how is that different from possession, so to speak? Or how does that, yeah. how does God's life dwell in us and yet we still have freedom? It's an interesting idea to t talk about that. Yeah, okay, so um, some pe sometimes people will say things like, oh, I feel possessed by the Holy Spirit, which isn't right, it's not the correct terminology, right? Because if a demon possesses a person, they're actually taking over their body, right? And they lose freedom, yeah, right? Yeah, and they're, and they're violating their personal identity in that way. And we mm -hmm. kind of see that on display in the Gospels when Jesus encounters demoniacs. But the Holy Spirit respects our personhood, right? And operates uh, uh, in, in, in full respect of our freedom. And I think one way to think about it is in terms of the virtues. So if you look at the Catholic list of virtues, and then you look at the get list of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. you start to see a lot of overlap. Yeah. And you're thinking, well, why is that the case, right? Aren't, isn't a virtue like a, a habit of my will, not really something that God gives to me? Like, how do those work together? And the way that the church will explain it is that the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are super added to the virtues, right? The, they're perfections that are like virtues, but they're sort of like super virtues, right? They're like extra virtues that are over and above what you might be able to achieve through just discipline and good habits, right? That... Um, when we possess the gift of the Holy Spirit, we possess something better than or, or than simply a virtue, right? It's beyond uh, the limits of our personality. Mm. I, w w a natural analogy I think of with life within us that's d distinct from our own, that gives us life, I think of what we know a lot about now uh, in modern science, and that is our gut biome, right? Sure. You have billions of these cells that you can't see that are in you, but they help you digest. Yeah. They give you energy and they give you life. And it's a life within you that's not your same DNA. It's, it's a different life. And yet that life cooperates and works with our life. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit's a lot like that. Is that. What do you think about that analogy? I, I think it's okay, except I, I would think that <laughs> our, on, it's a great our gut microbes might be a little bit lower on the it, scale yeah. of you know, being I, than the Holy Spirit, but... Uh, uh, fair enough, but, but I, I, I'm just trying to think of yeah. a life within us that it, it, yet it doesn't uh, override our own. I think that's freedom. true, right? I, but I think the, the, the key difference, right, is that our relationship with the Holy Spirit is oriented toward interpersonal communion, mm, that's right? A good so, so the yep. Holy Spirit helps us to participate in the life of God uh, and dwells within us by sanctifying grace and empowers us through these gifts, right? And enhances our virtues and so forth. But uh, ultimately we're called to be one with the mm. Holy Spirit, right? We're called to fall in love, so to speak, 
with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to be in interpersonal communion with them for all eternity. Well, you, you mentioned the gifts of the Spirit, so let's just talk about some of these individual gifts so people can get an idea of what these gifts of the Holy Spirit are sure. so that we can then think about how the Holy Spirit works in us. Yeah, so uh, these are listed in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, and, the, and uh, the church categorizes them as seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so we think of wisdom. Everybody who prepares for confirmation knows these gifts, exactly, right? Because right? it's one of the things you have to learn at confirmation, yeah, every so, Catholic. So there's the gift of wisdom, right? Which is a, one of the intellectual virtues, right? But here it's the gift of wisdom, which is super added to the intellectual virtue of wisdom. And wisdom is the intellectual virtue that considers God right, as the source of all things. There's uh, understanding, right? Which is another intellectual virtue. And now this is again, super added to by the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, strength is another one of these, uh, piety, the fear of the Lord. So there, there are all of these different um, gifts that the Lord gives to us that enhance our ability mm -hmm. to enter into that personal, interpersonal communion with Him. Well, let me, you bring out understanding and wisdom yeah. and uh, counsel as right. another, these gifts. And these are intellectual gifts, as you mentioned. Uh, and Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit as the spirit of truth. Yeah. So let's just talk about the idea that the Holy Spirit is called by our Lord, the spirit of truth, and the gifts that he gives us are about enlightening our mind. And so is there a relationship between those two things? Yeah, I, th I think so, right? That it, it, I think sometimes we miss the point of, of the whole intellectual virtue thing, right? Sometimes it can seem kind of abstract or weird or um, unfriendly or something. But in fact, right, heaven is nothing but an intellectual vision of God for all mm. eternity, where our, our mind, our intellect will be totally overwhelmed by the presence of God. So if you think about the intellectual virtues and the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are oriented in this kind of intellectual way, they're preparing us for the life of heaven, right? They're preparing us to take in that vision and receive well, well, it. That's so different from what a lot of people use to describe the Holy Spirit, that I felt the Spirit. I, sure. You know, it's like an emotion. Yeah. But you're talking about how the Holy Spirit operates with our mind. Yes. Uh, yeah. And that seems to where the gifts focus on, the gifts of the Spirit primarily work in our mind rather than in our emotions. Yeah, that's true, that's true, right? And that there's a way in which our, our intellectual gifts rise above, right, our emotional experiences. Mm -hmm. So, and this I think is, you know, illustrated in the way the church describes the, the spiritual life as this kind of journey. And early on in the journey, it has a kind of like, uh, really kind of uh, rough and tumble, kind of very emotional character to it, where we talk about lots of consolations early on in the spiritual life. And then as time progresses, right, the constellations get fewer and fewer, the feelings get fewer and fewer, and yet the communion with God is getting stronger and stronger and stronger, and our love is growing, right? And this is why we, we can refer to the Holy Spirit as love, right? So he's the spiration of love between the Father and the Son, right? He proceeds from the Father and the Son as love and as gift, right? He empowers us to enter into the life of the Trinity, which is love. So speaking of love, you know, Paul in Romans 5 talks about the, you know, the, the love of God has been poured in to our hearts, yes. who is the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. So the, this idea of the Holy Spirit being poured into our hearts. So, you know, we know that you, we, it's easy to think of God the Father or Jesus as outside of ourselves, right? but it's the Spirit of God that's more interior to ourselves. Yeah, well, the whole Trinity dwells in us by sanctifying grace, but we attribute it to the Holy Spirit, that indwelling presence. Uh, and the Holy Spirit in this way, right, helps us to pray, mm. right, and aids us in our communion with God. Mm -hmm. So there's a way in which the Holy Spirit in some ways is like closer to us, right, or closer to me than I am to myself, right, to use uh, the language of our, of our patron, right? Augustine. There's a way in which the Holy Spirit is so close to us that uh, we kind of forget about Him, right? Uh, and, and we kind of overlook Him, but in fact, it's his action in our souls that's drawing us into the life of the Trinity. So I, I love that image and I, I wanna think about it, I wanna explore that a little bit because the idea that the Holy Spirit indwells us and gives us wisdom, gives us counsel, and as well as fortitude, which now starts to move into the will. Uh, would it be true to say that for people who experience the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit helps them know the truth but also helps them move with love towards that, that empowers them mm. to live the Christian life. Yeah, yeah, so, right, I think uh, you put your finger on this idea of the Holy Spirit as power, right? Mm. That the, the Holy Spirit in a certain way is um, how we get in, in touch with the power of God, right? So if we're thinking of, you know, the power of the miraculous or the power of the sacraments, the power of sanctifying grace in us, 
right? The Holy Spirit puts us in touch with the power of God so that we might be transformed and changed and renewed so that we're not just kind of left out in the cold to sort of like figure things out on our, on our own. No, actually God helps us, right? Mm-hmm. God gives us grace so that we can enter into that, into that life with him. And so the Holy Spirit has a special role in kind of delivering or being the power of God in our soul to change us and renew us. Well, Margot asked the question, how do the fruits of the Holy Spirit relate to the uh, gifts of the Holy Spirit? So you yeah. have the fruits of the Holy Spirit and the gifts. Is that the same thing or is that different? Yes, yeah, so the fruits of the Holy Spirit are mentioned in Galatians 5, and 23, love, joy, peace, patience, this sort of thing. And what we, I think we should think of those as the, um, the fruits of the virtuous life, right? that when God comes to dwell in us by sanctifying grace and we start to live like Jesus, we actually start to become like Jesus and our life starts to overflow with all of these goods, right? So the good of love for God and for others, right? The good of joy, the good of peace in our hearts, right? That when we're living at peace with God and when we're living the life of the Holy Spirit, it's going to bear fruit, yes, in good works and in in good deeds, but also in this kind of like, way of life that's expressed by the fruits of the Holy Spirit. I really like that imagery because I think uh, what you're saying is that the, the more we learn to love God with His love, that is the Holy Spirit, and our neighbor, uh, and we die to self by the power of God's love, right? We start to love others more than ourselves. Yeah. The more we're going to have peace, yes. the more we're going to have joy, yeah. the more we're going to have that love and all those fruits of the Spirit. And so the gifts of the Spirit empower us to live a certain way and then those fruits, it's kind of like what, you, what it relates to, you know, Jesus says, you will know a tree by its fruits. Yeah. And, uh, you know, if we're really plugged into the Holy Spirit, well, you just look at St. Francis of Assisi or St. Faustina, you know, whose feast day is today. They bore the fruits of the Spirit, right? Yes, um, yes. By that kind of serenity and peace and joy that they had. Yeah, and I think this is where it goes back to that, that idea of the living water uh, and in Jesus' conversation with the Samaritan woman that the Holy Spirit creates within us this life of grace, which is a life-giving process, mm-hmm. right? Where he pours his life into us, Romans 5, 12, and then his life kind of flows out of us uh, so that we become Christians, as it were, right? Little mini Christs walking the world. And, and that, and that the, the process of grace is at work within us to heal and bless and deliver, not just us. It's not just like, uh, Christianity is not a personal achievement, right? It's a way of being. Right? And it changes everything. And so I, I think allowing God's life-giving process to work within us through the sacraments, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and then allowing it to flow out of us in the life of virtue and grace and generosity. Right? That's what this is about. We have a great question here that Randy asks. and is, Randy says, I, I relate to, the, to God the Father and I relate to the Son, but not to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. What should I do? Yeah. How to build that, I love that relationship, that communio with the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I think there are a few things we can do, right? The church gives us great prayers, right? The come Holy Spirit prayer, the Veni Creator Spiritus, which we pray on Pentecost. So probably praying with those prayers is a great first step toward developing a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And then I think reflecting on the passages in scripture that discuss the Holy Spirit. Mm. So obviously Pentecost in Acts chapter two, John chapter four, which keeps coming up, right? And then these other depictions of the life of the Holy Spirit, particularly in the book of Acts, which is sometimes referred to as the gospel of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because Jesus has ascended into heaven and yet the Holy Spirit is still present in the disciples and with the disciples and he's doing miracles through them and changing people and bringing the gospel to the ends of the earth. So I think reflecting on the book of Acts, praying those prayers that the church gives to us to the Holy Spirit, those will help enhance our relationship with him. I love that suggestion of reading Acts of the Apostles uh, to really get into the Holy Spirit, really, because the Holy Spirit is the main protagonist. We call it the Acts of the Apostles, but it's really the Holy Spirit yeah. who's the primary character in exactly. Acts of the Apostles. And reading the Acts of the Apostles will be a great introduction to the life of the Spirit. Exactly. Right. And, we, and we start to see how the life of grace works, right? Where the Apostles aren't just proclaiming the gospel as if it's some sort of new philosophy or political propaganda, right? They're proclaiming the life of the Holy Spirit, Mm. right? By proclaiming the message of Jesus and the Holy Spirit's working with them and in them and through them. And you see this throughout Paul's letters, don't you? I mean, Paul talks about the power, the dunamai of the Holy Spirit and the action and the grace of the Holy Spirit uh, throughout. So that's another place to read and discover how central the Holy Spirit is in the Christian life. That's true. And uh, like, 
you know, we talk about Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, where the Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles in great power. But if you read the, the book carefully, that kind of happens again and again, right? It happens again in chapter 10 at the household of Cornelius. The Holy Spirit comes upon the Gentiles. It happens again in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. The Holy Spirit comes upon these people who sort of believed in John the Baptist and his preaching, but didn't really know about the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit has this way of transforming people's lives, right? Mm -hmm. and, and filling them with his gifts. For, uh, Robert asks, how do I know if it's the Holy Spirit or an evil spirit working within in my life? Yeah, well, I mean, this is where the idea of discernment of spirits, right. which St. Paul talks about briefly in 1 Corinthians 12, and of course is a huge theme in Catholic spiritual tradition, particularly in the writings of St. Ignatius of Loyola. That's where studying and learning about discernment of spirits and the rules of discernment of spirits can be really helpful in our own life in discerning the will of God and the voice of God in our soul. Uh, and this, this uh, idea of like, is this from the Lord or is it not from the Lord? Yeah, that's so important. And Father Timothy Gallagher on Formed has a great series on discerning spirits that I yes. recommend. And then the other idea too is that one of the objective things to help ground us is that if it's the voice of God, it leads to peace. Yeah. If it's the voice of God, it leads us to the Ten Commandments, to the moral life. Yeah. The voice of the devil leads to disunity, disruption, uh, you know, a, a lack of peace yeah. and tranquility, and it leads us away from God's moral law. Yeah. Well, so one Old Testament example on this point is Deuteronomy 13, which is the law about false prophets. Mm. So yep. it's a really interesting law because it says, well, if somebody comes along and starts prophesying, his prophecies come true, and then he says, here, let's go worship other gods. You need to stone him. <laughs> You're thinking, <laughs> This is such a weird law, yeah. right? But the, the orientation of the false prophet is toward false worship, right? And the orientation of the Holy Spirit is toward the true worship of God. And so when, when we're hearing things that are leading us away from God, away from the life of virtue and grace, and toward this kind of dissension or, or, or whatever, yeah. this is not from the Lord, right? And we need to turn to Him, right, and, 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 uh, and enter into true worship. I love that example from the, the, the false prophets versus the true prophets. And that's something that Israel has to be able to discern, yes. talk about discerning spirits throughout her history, and the church does too. Jesus talks of about course. this, you know, even in his letters to the churches, the seven churches, he'll say to the church of Ephesus, he commends them for recognizing those who are basically false apostles, right? right. As, and discerning those who are true, yeah. uh, truly sent and represent the Lord. Yes. Well, and this is where we can always defer to the church's wisdom in these matters, right? And if there's any question about doctrine or about teaching, we can always turn to the church, right? And, and to the resources that the magisterium provides to arrive at where the Holy Spirit is leading the church into all truth, right? And away from falsehood. You know, and that, your allusion goes back to, I think, John 14, that Jesus talked about giving you the spirit of truth after I leave. Yes. And then in John 16, he says, you know, it's for your good that I must depart so that the paraclete, the advocate, yes. the, the spirit may come. Why is it that, you know, Jesus has to leave for the Spirit to come? Yeah. Oh, I mean, that's a great mystery. I don't know if I have a good answer for that <laughs> one, right? I mean, I think that um, the beauty of it, right, uh, and the appropriateness that we can see in it is that when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us in a special way, each one of us can begin to do the works of Jesus, right? So that instead of there being one man walking around Galilee, healing and blessing and delivering, it can be a billion people, mm. right? Doing the works of Jesus all over the world. So in that sense, right, the Holy Spirit empowers us to do the works of Jesus and even then some, right? Um, but uh, as to solving that mystery, I don't know if, if we'll ever really understand. I, there was a, I was thinking of a reflection that St. John Paul II had in his encyclical on, on on, on the Lord and gift on yeah. the Holy Spirit. And he talked about how Jesus is probably referring there to the idea that he has to go on his exodus. He has to die, mm -hmm. but his death will atone for sin, which will allow the Spirit mm -hmm. to indwell. And so at Jesus' death, the temple veil is torn, mm -hmm. and the Spirit of God seems to leave this barrier uh, between the, you know, the, the Holy of Holies, where the Holy Spirit is kept, uh, and almost contained, right? Mm. And now the Spirit is going to be let loose at Pentecost yeah. because of Jesus' sacrifice. Yeah, well, and, and really, I mean, that's a beautiful Old Testament, New Testament connection, which is the pillar of fire, mm. right? And then the pillar of fire, right, it dwells with the Israelites and leads them through the wilderness and then comes to dwell in the tabernacle. And then we see the pillar of fire again in Acts chapter 2 when the tongues of fire come upon the apostles. 
to dwell in the church, right, which is the new temple of God. So there's a way in which there's a kind of transfer of anointing, right, from Old Testament to New Testament, from the tabernacle and temple to the, to the new temple, which is the church. Speaking of new temples, Madeline asks, what is the Blessed Mother's relationship with the Holy Spirit? Yeah, so the Blessed Mother, uh, I like to describe her as the first charismatic, right? She <laughs> is the one who is perfectly docile to the Holy Spirit. And if you look at the very beginning of the Gospel of Luke, there are a few characters that are filled with the Holy Spirit. Mary is filled with the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit, John the Baptist is filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is language taken from the Old Testament where we see David, right, anointed with the Holy Spirit, the judges, the prophets of the Old Testament, anointed and filled with the Holy Spirit. So Mary is the one who's perfectly docile to the will of God, right, let it be done unto me according to your word, right, and she's totally docile to the movements of the Holy Spirit, right, would that we were, right, that we could perfectly hear God's voice and be perfectly obedient at every time, right, but in fact, it's more complicated than that because we're, you know, we have sin and all of these disadvantages, but the Blessed Mother is perfectly docile to the voice of the Holy Spirit, and that's really the model for us. It really is. I love the idea of Mary's receptivity to the Holy Spirit. When, how do you grow in the power of the Holy Spirit? Be receptive to God, hear God's Word, obey God's Word, and just, you know, that receptivity is really a great model that Mary shows us. Well, Shirley asks, when does someone get the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, so we receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit at baptism, and then they're strengthened with the gift of confirmation. So this is a little bit complicated, though, because while we have them because of sacramental grace, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're all that active, right? I could get baptized and then forget about God and Christianity mm -hmm. and go my own way, right? But we possess the grace in a sacramental sense, but then there's a way in which we can pray and ask the Lord to enhance those graces, to bring them mm -hmm. to, to bear, to bring them to the surface, and to allow them to grow, right? To actualize those gifts. Exactly. Would it be analogous to somebody who might have a great you know, intellectual uh, facility, somebody who's sure. got a great memory or they've got a, a really sharp mind, but they're lazy, they don't study, they don't apply themselves, and so they don't fulfill the potential they have intellectually. And for us, we have to fulfill the potential that's been given to us it, with the gifts of the Spirit. Yeah, yeah, so that's true, right? But the, the key difference, though, is it's not about us, right? It's about Him. So there's this kind of like interactive part where it's actually God working in me. It's not just me working in me. And so, so there's a, that kind of participatory nature makes it complicated to think about. Right, I, that reminds me of an image uh, uh, that Father Ronald Garigou Lagrange had, that uh, the Holy Spirit acts in our lives, but we have to be receptive, and it's like a, a, a sailboat. Yeah. If you have the sail up, you know, that doesn't mean that if there's no wind, you, the sailboat doesn't get propelled. But the wind is the Holy Spirit. Yes. And the Holy Spirit now has something to push on, right? Yes. To work with. And if we're willing to be receptive to the Holy Spirit, now the Holy Spirit can propel us. And that's what the lives of the saints show us. Versus those who are unwilling and unloving, unreceptive, are like that sailboat that have the sails down and we miss the wind. Yeah, no, and this is like where the rubber meets the road in the spiritual life, where it gets difficult, right? Mm -hmm. Where the, the conflict between what I want and what I want becomes very difficult, right? And Romans 7 becomes really real for us, where we, we feel the difficulty of our selfishness and our desire for God at the same time. And we pray that the Lord will deliver us from our selfish desires and help us learn how to love. Mm. And that's a lifelong process. It really is. Well, Mark, this has been a joy to have you on and to discuss the Holy Spirit. Thank you for being with us. And I'm going to talk about what we, who we have on next week. It's a, a, a wonderful artist. And, and as a transition point, I, I reflect on the catechism and actually uh, the reflection of the tradition talks about the Holy Spirit as kind of the divine iconographer, right? That the Holy Spirit is making the image of Jesus, the Son of God, in our hearts and in our souls. And we're going to talk to somebody who is a great iconographer and a wonderful artist, Elizabeth of Alaska next week. And we're going to talk about how she does her wonderful works, and she's done some beautiful icons for us here at the Augusta Institute. Of course, the image of our patrons in Augusta, she has that one in our chapel and many others. And so we're going to talk to Elizabeth Slasco and talk about uh, Catholic art. And I, I think it'll be, we're going to show you some great images of some great Catholic art and just talk about the beauty and purpose of Catholic art in our lives and in the lives of the church and, and, and in our community. And so I'm really looking forward to having Elizabeth Zlasko on next week. And I want to thank everyone for supporting us in our mission circle. All of you who support us monthly by giving a little bit, maybe $10 a month, you allow us to have this ministry and we're deeply grateful for you and we wish the Lord to bless all of you. God bless.